Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 76. How well do you know Python's math module? Maybe you've used a few of the constants or arithmetic functions, but you may be surprised by the amount of functionality hiding within this built-in library. And perhaps you don't need to reach for another additional outside library. This week on the show, David Amos is back, and he's brought another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. We discuss a recent video course about the math module, and David shares a recent article about implementing efficient queues and stacks with Python's DEC, double-ended queue class. We also talk about an article that shares 25 pandas functions you may not have known to exist. We cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including visualization and interactive dashboards in Python with Holoviz, designing a camera with Python and PyRayT, Graphing Data Science with Python and Network X, another useful Python PDF library, and runtime software verification that includes automated testing for scientific software in Python with a project named Paranoid Scientist. This podcast episode is brought to you by DataStax Astra DB, built on Apache Cassandra, now made easy in the cloud. Get 40 gigabytes of storage free every month at astra.dev slash Python. All right. Let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, David. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me back. All right. Looks like you're starting off with uh, another article by Leodonis. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Leodonis is on a roll. This one is called Python's Deck implement efficient queues and stacks. And if you haven't heard of DEC before, it's a double-ended queue, which is can be a very useful data structure when you need, especially like efficient operations of appending things. You can think of it as like a, a, a list in a, in a sense, but uh, it allows you to do operations like appending and removing things from either side of the list very efficiently. Yeah. It's spelled as D-E-Q-U-E. It is, yeah. Which is confusing. Yeah, I think some people probably look at it and and pronounce it D-Q. Yeah. And I think that also makes a lot of sense. But uh, if you read the documentation, the official Python docs, they do mention that it's it's meant to be pronounced deck, like D-E-C-K. Yeah, like a deck of cards or whatever. Right. And I guess like for comparison, you know, a list, you can, you can efficiently like pop items from a list. The list has a pop method. By default, it's going to take it off of the very end of the list, like the last item in the list will will come off. And the same thing, if you append to a list using the append method, then it's going to append it to the end, like after the last item of the list. Now you can pass an argument to pop, like you could call pop uh, zero, where zero is the index that you want to pop, and it's going to pop off the first item. But it's not very efficient because what happens is It'll pull that first item off of the list and then it has to like shift everything down. So it actually ends up having a higher complexity having to to do that. So you can use you can use a list efficiently as like a like a last in, first out kind of queue. People call it like these LIFO uh queues. Yeah. But if you need to like pull things off of the front of the list, then it's not the best choice. And that's kind of where this deck thing comes in. So this whole article talks about DEC data structure, DEC module. So you have to import DEC in order to, to use it. And it gets into, you know, all the basics. You know, what why is it different from a list? How is it implemented? And uh, whether or not it's thread safe, which it is. And the memory efficiency, things like that. And then it gets into uh, just all the different operations. So how you pop and append items from it. How you can access random items from inside of a DEC. And then a couple of sort of uh, applications, you know, how to build efficient queues uh, using DEC, 
So a deck is a sequence, which a sequence is anything anything in Python that you can access things by like numeric index, right? So like anything where you could put the little square brackets with a, an integer inside of it would be considered a sequence. So things like tuples and lists, even strings are sequences. A deck is a sequence type as well. So the article explores what that means and kind of the different things you can do with that. Things like counting the number of a certain value that appears in it, getting the index of a value, reversing the the deck and, and all that kind of stuff. So it really goes into a lot of detail on all that and then takes a look at putting putting it into action and actually giving you uh, kind of an example where where you would use this and and how it might look in your code. So definitely definitely a good read. And I guess just to to clarify, for example, one of the one of the examples that he that Laodonis looks at is uh, emulating the tail command on a uh, from Unix, where you can take like a, a file path, pass it to this tail command, and look at the last few lines in a file, and you can tweak it to look at any number of lines. And so he talks about how to implement something like that using a deck. Yeah, really great read, very in depth, uh, lots of good info in there for sure. So if you're looking at uh, learning some more data structures and you know, want to want to see how you would do this in Python. It's there for you. You don't have to build these things from scratch like you you would in uh, some other other languages. So definitely a cool cool feature. Yeah, we've focused on a lot of these data structures. Um, yeah, kind of going back to previous conversations, we've talked about the collections modules and all the different kinds of tools in there. And so this is a nice uh, a, another tool that's you know, hiding inside there for people to kind of play with. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, it's one of those things. You know, I think if you're just getting started with Python, you probably don't want to, well, if if you're just getting started with Python and also new to programming, you probably don't want to really worry about these kinds of things yet. And I think that, you know, from a design perspective, just the the plain old Python list covers so many of the like most common use cases and does it really well. You can can go a long way (laughs) without ever even knowing that you need something something different but yeah once you kind of get beyond that you know take it to the next level this is this is definitely a good one to be aware of and might even come up in in some interviews so yeah definitely my first one is from the towards data science medium blog which we've mentioned multiple times this one is from sophia yang and sophia is a senior data scientist at anaconda (laughs) it's really a short love letter to this uh really powerful visualization and interactive dashboard tool called Holoviz. And Holoviz is definitely a powerful package. It includes so many of the libraries you might have already heard us talk about. (laughs) Yeah. Things like Bokeh, Matplotlib, Dask, Plotly. It even goes much further than that. And it, it sort of combines them all into this overall overarching package that you can learn to work in lots of these different situations. And it could be, you know, generally we've talked about data visualization inside of notebooks or inside of Python files, but, you know, often as a person who is creating data visualizations for other people and dashboards for people, one of the other things you might do commonly is create reports and PDFs or individual graphs coming out of these things or making like a server that serves those things out. This is another tool that could fit inside that. A couple things about it. This is a real short read. It it really is just kind of giving you an idea of some of the things that are available in it and things that you can do with it. It truly, in my opinion, is a thing that works best in Anaconda or Miniconda. It seems to be much the preferred method for getting this all set up. I'm not saying you can't in other ways, the way that it's sort of packaged and, and sort of distributed, it it feels much more like that seems like a plan. And it's pretty big when you install it. Like the footprint that I got after installing, you know, all of his was like around two gigabytes for kind of everything that came with it, which is pretty big for, for a library. Yeah. But again, it, it includes so many other libraries inside of it. And I will include links to the uh, all of his documentation, which talks about the libraries that are inside of it. It mentions seven of them. Panel, which is where I would probably spend most of my time because I was very interested in the idea of dashboards and having these panels with interactive controls and 
you can put things like you know a bouquet tool inside there along with all the different controls or plotly or what have you but it also has you know hv plot all the views geo views which it's a great library if you want to do stuff with maps data shader which takes the shading elements that you may want to do in some of your data visualization actually amps it up quite a bit which is nice um, an area called param like parameter <laughs> and then color set and I just, you know, if you're interested in diving deeper into data visualizations and data science, I would say this is a, a good one-stop shop for all of that. And the tutorial is pretty intense. It, you know, like I said, it takes another two gigabytes to get the tutorial file set up and, and running on a machine, but they open up inside of a Jupyter notebook and kind of walk you through everything and it, definitely if i was doing a lot more in the data science world i could see having a machine all set up and, and running all this stuff because it kind of combines all of them together and and, and is uh you know kind of maintaining some of those libraries underneath it and it builds on top of that whole scipy pi data and they call it the pi viz ecosystem yeah in her article the short article about it she talks about directly about her workflow and has kind of a you know starting out with a pandas data frame and then figuring out where that she would want to plot it and it, dividing time in between this thing called hv plot or if it's geographic data into geo views and then if you're dealing with lots and lots of data you might be looking at things like the data shader to be able to you know kind of give you another uh, dimension for that at the very end of it building up the panel which is the interactive dashboard or application for it and she provides a nice little example um which uses bokeh to kind of create some controls and within like i don't know it's like seven eight nine lines of code you've created a whole dashboard uh set up inside there and bokeh is really nice i you know did a whole tutorial on it and the, the not only is it you know give you a lot of interactive controls where people can kind of play with it in that dashboard sense but there's like little save buttons to save what you've you know, if you've done any kind of navigating of the data, you can kind of save out um, images from it, which is really nice. And to be able to set those things up, it's also nice because you can just output that whole thing as an HTML file, which has all the data and everything in it. It's like just a, you know, like if you will, a static file that you could host somewhere. Yeah. Just pretty slick. So yeah, I, you should check it out. I think what I liked about this, you know, is that it kind of, you know, it starts with the pandas data frame, which is where a lot of data analysis starts. Yeah. And then, you know, from there, it's kind of like, okay, well, if you want to have some sort of data visualization pipeline, typically you would go looking for these different projects, right? And try to kind of like build something that works for you. Whereas, you know, if, you, if you're at that point of like, I just need to, I need to get something that works you know, this can save you a lot of time. I mean, it's it's the whole sort of pipeline there for you. Uh, obviously opinionated, but it does look like it's pretty uh, customizable. So, so yeah, I think, you know, if you're, if you have existing workflows and things, you know, Holoviz might not be something that you're going to fit into that. But if you're just getting started and you need to move quickly, it looks like this has got everything to to get you up and running from from end to end yeah definitely and uh sometimes you run into the edges of things like you're like oh i just created all this stuff with matplotlib but i want it to be interactive oh okay well right or oh, i want to do this thing or whatever it's like this would <laughs> if you'd like to do it as a visualization it's probably here <laughs> yeah which is nice but that means that it, it's a pretty large library to be able to to be able to work in all those circumstances This podcast is sponsored by Datastax Astra DB. Astra DB is built on Apache Cassandra and is now made easy in the cloud. Create a free Cassandra database in minutes for global scale on a startup budget with 40 gigabytes of storage free every month. Visit us at astra.dev slash Python. That's A-S-T-R-A dot D-E-V slash Python. What do you got next? The next one I've got is an interesting one. It comes from Ryan Frazier. It's called Design a Camera with Python and 
pirate or pirate. I'm not, I'm not really sure how uh, that part is meant to be pronounced, but this uh, pi, it's a pi and then the word ray and then T, I, I think for ray tracer. Yeah, that's what it seems like. A package that he created. Now, it's not sort of like the, you think of ray tracers, you think of like graphics, right? Like um, you see lots of people posting pictures of, I built a ray tracer and it's like they've got a sphere (laughs) over like some kind of flat landscape or something. This is not really what that is intended for. So it sounds like Ryan is very interested in uh, cameras and optics. And this is a tool that's meant to be able to meant to be used to explore the way he words it is optical system. So like if you're trying to design a camera or if you're trying to design, I think it would work for anything like a a telescope or some kind of system that involves a lens or multiple lenses, then this is something that would help you sort of model that and understand, you know, how is the light actually going to move through that system? So, you know, it's a pretty niche topic. But it looks like just a really cool package, and it can do a lot. You can actually create like a camera with it, or a lens, I guess. Uh, In in this tutorial, he just goes through kind of creating a a lens, and then you can draw that lens. So it's uh, I'm not sure. Oh, it uses the uh, tiny GFX package, which comes installed as part of the uh, PyRay T distribution, and you'll get a little plot. Uh, and little image of of what your lens looks like, like kind of a side on view of that, and then you can start doing things. It's got you know adjusting apertures and adding baffles, and then actually using the ray tracing part of it to send like light rays through the lens to see what what the lens is going to do, like well, how is it going to affect, and you can visualize all this straight from within the package, or it also integrates nicely with with Matplotlib. So. So it's, yeah, it's a really kind of interesting, I guess, use case. I've never thought about designing cameras before, but if you're, if you're into that or are interested in learning about optics, then I think, you know, even, even for like educational purposes, this might be kind of a neat way to you know, just to be able to visualize some of this stuff and get a, a more tangible, you know, rather than just solving a bunch of equations, I guess, you know, to be able to actually visualize it and see what's, uh, what's really going on. So a neat article. It includes a bunch of background about like how these lenses, how it works and like what a lens really is. And, you know, there's, there's a little bit of mathematics in there, but uh, nothing, nothing terrible. Yeah. But it does kind of, doesn't assume that you are a lens maker. It definitely (laughs) kind of walks you through like, you know, what, what all the different things mean and, uh, and everything. But beyond that, you know, it's a cool article. It's a cool tool. I think it would be an awesome project to just to, just to check out, just to read and, and uh, see, you know, what's what's going on under the hood there, and how's how did Ryan uh, do all this? So, kind of ticks off all those those boxes for me, which I thought was really cool. I like the name of the the site, Photonics, uh, F O T O N X and Gizmos <laughs> and Gizmos, yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is a great name. And this really like looking through the article, you know, and and knowing a little bit about photography and spending time in it, and looking at these examples, it made me think about a set of lenses that you can buy that are kind of designed for creating those kind of funky looks that they're showing as like aberrations, like things you may not want. Right. There's this thing called the lens baby. You ever heard of that? I have not. It It's a lens that the, the tube of it, if you will, the middle part between the two main lenses is flexible. And so you can kind of tilt and shift. And maybe you've seen pictures that look like that mm-hmm. where you, know, you look at like a, a shot of like a busy street and everything looks like toys. You know, it looks like kind of this weird, it's an actual f- photograph or video of this action happening. But the way that the the light is going through this camera and this lens, it makes everything look like like it's a set of toys. You know, it's a really interesting kind of look. Huh. Yeah. And so they have this tilt transformer thing for that. And anyway, I was always kind of intri- intrigued by that. And this like, made me think about like, okay, well, this is explaining like some of the reasons why and, and, you know, the, the shift of the focal lengths and the aberrations that you kind of get. It's, it's, it's a cool article. Thanks for sharing that. That's cool. Yeah. All right. So continuing on data science, um, if you will, I've got a fun article called 25 pandas functions you didn't know existed. 
Well, it said a formula guaranteeing that you probably don't know most of them. <laughs> yeah, 80, 80% probability. This is, uh, the author is Bex, B-E-X-T. I don't know, T is the last name. And it's another Towards Data Science uh, Medium blog. And I won't go through all of them. I don't want to spoil it, but it, it's a really nice resource. I was, uh, yeah. there were a few that I was not aware of, yeah. um, which was really great. And so I thought I'd share a handful of them to kind of give you an idea of like the types of things that you might run into here and learn a little more about. The first one that's mentioned is one that is actually in a recent uh, course of ours um, about pandas. Um, it's called Excel Writer, and it's a generic class that's right inside of pandas for creating Excel files. That's something that, that's covered in this um, reading files, uh, reading and writing files in Pandas course um, that Darren just recently put out. And it, it's actually pretty powerful. It's not only just like reading them in, but it's creating them and it can create individual sheets. That whole course dives very deep into the Pandas IO, the you know input-output API. And the second is uh, called Pipe and allows you to chain multiple custom functions uh, onto like a single operation. So you can kind of say in a single statement, I would like to do this and then pipe, meaning take the result of this and put it into this. And you kind of can like, the example they have is like, okay, you know, do this drop duplicates, then remove the outliers, then you know, encode categoricals and you know, piping each one as you go, which really reminds me of uh, working inside of R with this uh, dplyr and the tidyverse stuff. A really slick way to kind of chain these operations together. Number seven, I liked a lot also, which is uh, the T attribute for data frames, which stands for transposing. So a common thing you may want to do is you know get all the results of of uh, like you know looking at the data frame itself, and you want to see like you know using like describe and get the count, the mean, standard deviation, the twenty five, fifty, seventy five, you know percentiles and stuff, and if you have a big data set that's like really, really wide, you can sort of flip it on its head. Yeah. The T, which just transposes all the columns and rows, which is really pretty slick. And literally it's just dot T <laughs> as a, as a attribute that you can add, which is pretty slick. It's a capital T. Yeah. Capital Important. T. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of things are not right. <laughs> yeah. So, and then there's one about adding style to data frames. There's a, this really nice, function for that this panda styler has lots of stuff like you know highlighting areas or, or you know individual cells or you know just lots of different interesting style stuff like you know background gradients and it's got a good link to the documentation for that there convert d types which infers the best data types by default when you import data or bring a lot of data in very often it will just look at stuff and say these are all objects <laughs> you know, and objects are not a super efficient type um, inside of, you know, pandas as far as working with it. And so convert D types will actually you know, try to look, okay, well, these look like strings. It still doesn't do much with dates because um, there's still some extra parsing you need to do there. But for like, you know, numbers and, and strings and things like that, it still may be better for you to go back, you know, categorize things um, and, and things like that to also, you know, make your data frame smaller. And then the other two I want to share, like uh, one's called Mask, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. It might be a nice way to sort of hide certain values, uh, you know, like a, across a data frame that maybe they're sensitive in some way. It allows you a way to quickly replace all those cell values where like a custom condition is true. You can say, okay, and this is what I'd like to replace it with. And the example, they're, you know, putting like a NAN in there, but you could put, you know, you know, unavailable or you know some other kind of thing yeah a, a way of masking the data I, I thought that was very slick clip allows you to remove outliers um, you can kind of hard limit the top and the bottom of a range which is kind of nice to do in one command and then the other one was at and i at which are, are kind of similar to loc and i loc but in this case you're you're replacing single values at like an index and a label or the that's the at and then the i a a t i at is uh at a specific index comma index um inside of a data frame it's pretty slick and going through this i kind of ended up bouncing into the pandas uh documentation and i found this really kind of fun area of the documentation where pandas is kind of comparing itself with other things 
like, okay, let's say you're coming from R, all right, and, and you're familiar with certain R libraries. It gives you the comparisons there. Maybe you're like me, somebody who was working in SQL a ton, and suddenly now you're inside of Python and you want to be able to do SQL-like type, type of things. And then my favorite was this comparison with spreadsheets. And we talk about this all the time that, you know, the what the most common database used by everybody is right. is Excel. <laughs> and so if you're coming from Excel and you're like, okay, what well, what is a worksheet? You know, oh well, that's a data frame. Okay, well, what's a column? Well, they call them a series in this thing and you know, stuff like that. And um, it actually has nice pictures and exporting data, filtering, all these other kinds of stuff. So it's a nice section, and so I'll include a link for that also um, inside the pandas documentation. This comparison with spreadsheets. I thought was useful, but I really like this functions that you didn't know existed. Um, there were definitely a handful that I was like, oh yeah, those are really handy <laughs> kinds of stuff hidden inside of uh, pandas. Yeah. And you know, whenever I come across articles like these, I always, I'm a little skeptical. Like when I open it up, it's always like, right. Is it just going to be, you know, I don't know. It's like, if you're, if you're new to pandas, well then probably most of the pandas functions you didn't, no existed right like right right <laughs> and i i see a lot of articles that are like that it's like well you know here's a bunch of functions and it's like you know if you've been using pandas for a few months or you know a year a couple of years you know you already know all this stuff this is but yeah like, like you said this one genuinely had some that i was like okay yeah i've never yeah i've never heard of that and that's really interesting so maybe they maybe some of them didn't exist at the time or you know pandas is such a huge library yeah. though that and it's uh, moving it's you know it's constantly yeah, it's, they keep keep pushing it forward which is great exactly but yeah so yeah definitely something that uh when i came across it was sort of like really and then it was like oh yeah actually there's a lot in here that i didn't <laughs> know about that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah nice i guess continuing the theme of uh data science and get your your next one yeah very data science heavy uh episode today yeah this one is a Near and dear to my heart, I guess, in terms of the topic that it's talking about, it is graph data science with Python and Network X. I am a huge fan of what's called graph theory. It's what I studied when I was uh, still in school. And Network X is a really cool Python library that I've used in the past to uh, work with uh, these graphs and do different things with them. It's really kind of like it's not really a data science library. It's meant for really any, like, I think it's, you know, it, scientific computing, you know, researchers, you know, that kind of stuff. But it implements a ton of these different graph algorithms. And I mean, a ton, a ton of them. Okay. You can use that if you have a data set and you want to, uh, and it, it lends itself to being represented in as a graph structure, then you can use uh, Network X to do different kinds of analysis on it. And he gives, a, you know, kind of a, a background, like what is a graph and how do you create one using Network X and gets into some of those basics. I won't go over them here, but, you know, talking about like how do you visualize things and create images with Network X, so you can actually see these graphs that you've, you've built. But then he dives into kind of a little example analysis and it's, it's a little contrived, but it's also kind of fun. He uses Star Wars Episode Four. A New Hope, and looks at the characters. And let's see if I remember correctly, you've got your some different characters. He's got every, like Luke and Leia, you know, C three PO, R two D two, Chewbacca, Han Solo, Obi Wan. I mean, they're they're all there. Darth Vader, right. even things like Gold Leader and Red Ten, and like you know some of the <laughs> uh, those. Yeah, basically they're they're connected to each other if they have like a scene together in the movie. Oh, okay. So if they ever appear on screen at the same time, I think is like the specific thing, then then uh, the like the node for that that character, then they, those two characters like have an edge uh, between it. So then he starts looking at different ways you can sort of lay lay this out and visualize it and the different advantages of doing that. So there's like a, a circle layout that just kind of puts everyone around a circle and you can see all the edges. And like, it's kind of nice because you can... I mean, it's very easy to sort of parse the like the nodes are all just laid out in a circle for you. And you can kind of get a sense for like, oh, some of them don't have very many connections. Other ones have lots of connections, but it doesn't really give you much like helpful 
information out of it. So then he talks about viewing it using this uh, special kind of visualization algorithm called the Kamada Kawai, which is appropriately named a force directed algorithm for positioning <laughs> this. <laughs> there you go. Where basically the, the characters with the largest connections are like in the center of the visualization and ones that don't have lots of connections are kind of out among along the edges and then gets into doing some analysis looking at uh, the degree of nodes which is like the number of connections that they have and using the page rank algorithm to actually kind of rank the characters and things like that so it's just a good overview of kind of you know if you've never used network x before i think it's a really good kind of introduction to the kinds of things you can do with it without going into like a lot of uh, depth. It's very, uh, it's a very approachable article. You know, I think it's, uh, it's well written. I think the example, even though it's like, you know, I mean, Star Wars and, right. you know, but, <laughs> but also like it gives you something where like you don't have to think too much about the example and then you kind of get to see these cool things come out of it. Uh, so the neat article, it comes from Federico Albanese and uh, Federico, it looks as he worked at Facebook where he uh, worked on machine learning and model uh, predictions. So, and now he is in a university lecturer, it says. So yeah, very cool article. Uh, again, it's, you know, near and dear to my heart. I love graph theory and I, I, I like the network X package. So I wanted to, to feature that and uh, get the, get more awareness of it out there. Yeah, that's very cool. The more I kind of hear about graph theory and, and the way it's being used uh, across lots of different kinds of areas of, of Python. I keep getting intrigued, but I, I like this set of examples. Like it's definitely doing something that I'm familiar with at least, <laughs> you know, and like kind of giving you a nice good visualization then also kind of giving the counter examples like, okay, well this kind of layout is not going to work. So super great to, you know, prove these ideas. Yeah. And I, th I think, you know, if, if you do any kind of data analysis, or if you do any, any work for like a business, learning how to think in terms of graphs can be like a big kind of game changer. Like it can open up insights into a data set that you just can't really kind of get from other, you know, more traditional kinds of kinds of analysis. Yeah. You know, so it's good, I think, to sort of have that in your toolkit and just sort of think, is there another way I can sort of frame this problem in terms of, you know, like a, a graph and uh, and could I potentially discover something about my data set that I wouldn't have been able to discover otherwise. And I think, you know, if you read the article, it sort of proves that like you can do this very quickly and, and very easily using network X and uh, it shows off, you know, this page rank algorithm, but I mean, network X has hundreds and hundreds of graph algorithms uh, implemented in it. So it's, uh, it's pretty much got you covered <laughs> if whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to do uh, with graphs. Yeah. All right. My next one is a, a real Python video course. It's based on a, an an article that's been on the site for a while, but it's called Exploring the Python Math Module, and it's by one of our newer video instructors, Caesar Aguilar. And Caesar is a big fan of math, like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny for me to be talking about it, but that's actually why I wanted to feature it is because I'm you know I, I studied some math you know throughout high school and took some calculus in, in college, but I kind of burned out on it. Um, and that's partly just like my own background, like kind of things happened that ended up kind of souring, you know, what I was doing with it. And I, I probably didn't have the best teachers at the time, but I really enjoyed this course. Like I, I got a lot out of it. Um, not only from what you're getting as far as Python in it, but also just like examples of where this stuff comes into play and he did a really good job of fleshing a lot of that out and making it very interesting to me. And, and it covers, you know, the math module. It goes really deep into it. So you might have imported it before for pi or tau or some of these other constants that are part of the math module. Yeah. But he goes into factorials and rounding. We've talked about rounding before in simple kind of terms inside there, but there's also this closeness feature that you can use to kind of check you know, within a certain range of stuff. And he has really good examples for that. And then it goes into exponents, which were an area that I was always kind of a little fuzzy on. And he has some really good examples of, of working with exponents there and then kind of the reverse of it, logarithms. Mm -hmm. And then go, it goes into like the new features that something that I talked a little bit about in Python 3.8 
in my course about the cool features of Python 3.8, this uh, the GCD common divisor. Yep. It even gets into uh, a little bit of C math, complex numbers a little bit there. And, and again, not diving too deep into it, but enough that somebody like, oh, okay, I can see why this is important and, and see where it might be used. And then there's a tiny little part about like, you know, comparisons to like, okay, well, these are some things that like something like NumPy might be where you might diverge and go down that path. As not a math guy, <laughs> I found it very interesting and really well presented. And I think it's, you know, I, I'm going to feature it as the video course spotlight this week because I, I think there's a lot in it that people get out there. I'm, mean, you know, obviously programming, uh, it runs along, in some cases, very parallel with what's happening with math. But this was giving me lots of reasons why, okay, you know, if I'm needing to dive into more scientific or financial or other kinds of, you know, <laughs> situations, you know, I know where I can find these things now inside the the math module. Yeah, you know, it's, I, th- the math module is big and I don't think that people commonly reach for it. Yeah. When, like you mentioned, you know, there's some things you might do with like NumPy. And, and I think a lot of people that I've come across will sort of like immediately, oh, I need to do this. I need to, I need to install NumPy in order uh, to do that. So like kind of my favorite example of that is, is like calculating the, what we would call the norm of, of something like the, it's technically it's the Euclidean norm, like of a, of a vector. And yeah. basically that's where you're, you're computing in, in essence, the length of the vector, uh, or maybe it's a tuple array, something of numbers or, you know, floating point numbers. and you either are going to sort of write that yourself and use like the square root function and things like that, or you're going to call on, you know, NumPy. If you're already using NumPy, you know, then sure. I mean, go for that. But if you just, if you're trying to keep it lightweight, there is actually a function that I discovered not too long ago that uh, it's called Hypot, stands for yeah. hypotenuse and that's exactly what it's what it's for although it's the the change is very recent that they changed that to before is like if you basically would do uh like like the pythagorean theorem theorem basically like uh if you gave it two numbers it would calculate like the hypotenuse of a triangle where the side and the base are the two numbers that you pass to it now they've extended that to any any number of arguments to that function so you can do multi-dimensional vectors as well with that. And it's all just right in the in the math library. The other thing that I, I see, you know, is a common mistake made with with Python is using the sum function to sum mm. a list of floating point values. Yeah. And in a lot of cases that's okay. But whenever you need any kind of precision, there are a whole host of method or functions, excuse me, in the in the math module for working specifically with floating point values in order to uh, limit the, the error that you get, uh, the rounding error that you get with floating point values. So there's an F sum function that you can use to get a, a more accurate value when you're summing over all that. So yeah, there's just, there's a ton of stuff in it that, that, yeah, it seems like because of the, I guess, popularity of things like NumPy and SciPy, I, I have seen in people's code, they're reaching, they're like, you're installing one of those libraries to do this very specific thing. It's like, you've got that in the math module. <laughs> you don't need yeah, to, yeah. You don't I, I could think of that. it for like the video game kind of stuff, like you're talking about the points and, and you know, trying to do those kind of calculations and, you know, having the, the distance thing kind of built in. Well, you know, it, it's built in in the sense you're not having to like, you know, install another library. Right. Um, it's just ready to go, which you just say import. <laughs> so, and, and another one, I mean, I don't want to like, I guess I could, I could talk about this stuff all day, but just one, one more like a uh, little tip, I guess. And, you know, go watch Caesar's course. Cause I'm sure he covers <laughs> a bunch of this stuff too. But one that I really, really like is the, the, you mentioned before the is close function. Yeah. If you do any kind of testing with uh, where you need to test a function that has, you know, floating point output, like it returns a floating point value and, and it does some sort of computation in there. And there, there, there's some room like for error in that. And, and you want to say like, you're testing it and you want to say like, you know, does the function return the value that I'm expecting? Well, it might quote unquote be that value within some like really tiny error. Right. But, but if you just compare it with like the equals equals operator, like what you get from the function to whatever it is you're expecting, it's your test might fail. Yeah. 
and you don't want it to fail because it's it it's tech it's right or it's right enough and this is close function can be a real lifesaver uh there that's kind of where i've used it a lot in the past is in the in testing like that so another really cool one that's in there but yeah it's um i haven't watched the the course yet but it it does look like uh I'd want to, I'd want to go through that, but yeah, I love, I love the math module. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of surprising. They, they do keep adding stuff to it, you know, they do. which is, yeah. is really, really kind of cool. Like the, you know, they added the permutations and combinations and mm-hmm. keep adding these little, you know, little bits of, of things that you need. So again, you're doing maybe a little less reaching for additional libraries. And this is a, a really great survey of all that stuff. And, uh, you know, again, I really enjoyed it. And all this stuff is is you know written in in C. You know this is not like a pure Python yeah. module, and so you know it's fast. It's uh, you're not going to sacrifice much performance by using uh, using this stuff. So this week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. We've discussed this course quite a bit on this episode. It's titled "Exploring the Python Math Module." The course is based on a real Python article by Lahiru Liana Pathorana. And in the course, instructor Caesar Aguilar takes you through what the Python math module is, how to use math module functions to solve real life problems, the constants of the math module, including pi, tau, and Euler's number, differences between built in functions and math functions, and the types of situations that call for them, differences between math and C math, statistical functions and other functions that have been updated since Python version 3.8, and a comparison of when you would use an external library, such as NumPy. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how to take advantage of this powerful built-in Python library. Whether you're doing scientific, financial, or other mathematic projects, this course will help you harness its power. And like all video courses on real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections, and you get additional resources and code examples for the techniques shown check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. Gets us into uh, projects. And you have, (laughs) your your one's titled very interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and it kind of fits in, I guess, with this this theme talking about math and science, yeah. Graph and data science and <laughs> science and everything. So the the, uh, the project is called Paranoid Scientist, which is why I clicked on it because I was like, <laughs> I, like have, I have to see, <laughs> I have to see what that's about. And so I guess I will say I've not played with this yet, and I didn't. Yeah, I didn't really have time to sort of like go through and see what uh, you know, installing it and sort of playing with it. But I really like the idea of this. So this is the target audience for this package is definitely scientists and researchers who are publishing research that uses code for some part of their research and they have to publish that code in you know the journal or whatever but uh, how do they how do they verify that code how you know yeah scientists are not well I, I shouldn't say all most scientists are not software engineers and they're not going to learn pi tests just to like be able to test their their code or you know they don't want to get into that that kind of stuff but they want to know that like they they do want to know that the code is correct right i mean the sort of they could end up having a paper revoked or something if if there's some sort of major error there so what paranoid scientist does is create it, it gives you a bunch of decorators that you can sort of wrap your functions with that will do sort of the the validation and uh, the checking uh, for you and will actually run tests for you. So there's a kind of an automated testing component. There's sort of a data validation component and, and things like that. And rather than having to learn how to write all those tests or do all that, you just kind of learn these little decorators that you put around your function and, and, and have it uh, take over from there. And it looks really cool. And uh, like I said, I think it's just a really, really good idea to make this as easy as possible for folks that need to do this or would want to, but otherwise don't have the skill set or, or honestly, the time to get into that. So kind of a neat, a neat deal. It does everything from like fuzz testing, sort of like the hypothesis library does, if, if you've heard of that, 
And uh, it's inspired by things like contract-oriented programming, type classes, static type checking. So it kind of puts all of those things, which are sort of like, you know, software engineering best practices that a scientist is not going to know about. Or if they do know about it, they just, you know, maybe they don't have the time or have the expertise or whatever it takes to implement those kinds of things in their own their own work. So really, I think, cool idea. And I hope, you know, that they, they get some use out of this and, and see some people start using it. I think it's like, it's like really, really new within, well, I guess it's a couple of years. I must've been thinking of another project I looked at. Uh, it was still, I mean, just a, a couple of years old here. It looks like that they've, um, they've been doing this. So, uh, really neat. Yeah. Cool. I happen to be the guy who always talks about PDF stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I found another, uh, a PDF library. And I actually like this one a lot. This has got a lot of interesting things to it. And then what's been nice about it is the author has been creating a bunch of articles with sort of tutorials to kind of get you going with it. The library is called Borb. I'm guessing that's how it's pronounced. B-O-R-B. It has a interesting chunky little Twitter looking bird as the as the mascot, I'm guessing. And uh, it's created by Joris Shalikens, and I like the first line <laughs> from the documentation. The portable document format, PDF, is not a what-you-see-is-what-you-get format. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it is not. <laughs> it It is literally its own set of code um, and its own set of hassles and hair-pulling potentially and yeah, that's why I've been talking about a lot, but it's such a standard out there for people to need to send stuff in. And, you know, it's you know, literally the idea of a, of a you know document being sent back and forth over the web, you know, for anybody who's dealing with any form of small businesses, it's such a standard or even big businesses too. So it has two different methods. Uh, unlike some of the other libraries we've talked about, we've talked about libraries that are super precise where you're, you know, kind of plotting out the X's and Y's of where things are going to land on the page. It can do that, but it also, that's their low level sort of model mode. And then it has a high level model mode where you can kind of delegate and, and say, okay, uh, you know, these are the margins and these are the general positions. And then I want a column and then I want this. And it has kind of like a, a layout manager that you can kind of define these things in. I like the structure of it and the tutorials are actually pretty cool. They're posted on stackabuse.com. Um, um, there's a create a PDF document, which is sort of the hello world of it. And then there's an invoice one that goes a little deeper. And it had a feature that I was not familiar with in other libraries where you can embed additional files, mm -hmm. meaning that often when you deliver a PDF in some sort of automated system, it may be good to have sort of a, you know, a cargo <laughs> package with it that has the actual like, data from the document like as a json file and i thought that was cool that it has that uh, ability to embed those additional files i have seen that occasionally but this is giving it a nice kind of prescribed way something i'm interested in and might actually interact with the, the creator here a little bit is i've had to do a thing where i was creating a lot of forms like uh, you know basically creating field tools for people not just generating the pdfs but creating pdfs that are fillable Right. And um, I don't see where it's addressing that so much. That's why I, I was talking to Mike Driscoll a lot more about um, Report Lab because it had some of those features. But anyway, I've always been kind of looking for things that can do that. But like I said, this is really nice. And then he has a new one that's actually, I think, reading information from invoices. Um, that's the latest, latest tutorial. Anyway, so I'll include links for all those things. But yeah, another fun uh, look at potential library for working with pdfs in python yeah all right david well thanks so much for coming back on the show and bringing all these articles and stuff for sure thanks for having me all right talk to you soon yep see ya and don't forget this episode was sponsored by datastax astra db built on apache cassandra made easy in the cloud learn more at astra.dev slash python I want to thank David Amos for joining me again this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes, 
with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.